This video is for educational purposes only. Jennifer Ertman and Elizabeth Pena were just like any other teenagers growing up in the suburbs of Houston in the early 1990s. They loved hanging out with their friends, having fun and enjoying the innocence of their youth. But everything changed when on one seemingly ordinary summer night, they attended a friend's party, only to be ambushed, brutally harmed, and murdered by a gang of six men on their way back. This is an unfortunate story of an unthinkable crime, of justice sought and obtained, and of two lives tragically cut short. Our story takes us back to the early 1990s in Houston, Texas, a bustling city with a vibrant mix of cultures. At this time, Houston was experiencing significant economic and population growth, but it was not without rising crime rates, a reality that would sadly become all too relevant to our story. Born on August 15, 1978, at just 14 years old, Jennifer Ertman was the life of her family. She was known for her ready smile, her love for laughter, and a heart that held so much compassion. Jennifer was fond of animals and would often be seen looking after her family's pets. Jennifer was a caring friend, and always ready to lend an ear or offer a word of encouragement. Her friends remembered her as someone who could light up a room with her presence and her laughter. Born on June 21, 1977, Elizabeth Pena, often known as Liza, was 16 and the world was at her feet. The eldest of three children, she naturally had a strong sense of responsibility and leadership. Despite the two-year age gap, Jennifer and Elizabeth were as close as two friends could be. Jennifer Ertman, at just 14 years old, was the life of her family. Before meeting Jennifer, Elizabeth had been through a brief streak of teenage rebellion. But Jennifer's influence had a transformative effect on her, which her father referred to as her straightening up her act. As the sun began to set on June 24, 1993, Jennifer's father, Randy, dropped her off at Elizabeth's house. The girls had plans to attend a pool party at their friend Gina Escamilla's home in the Spring Hill Apartments. At around 8 p.m., Elizabeth's mother, Melissa, drove the girls to the party. As they exited the car, Elizabeth reassured her mother that they would be home by their agreed 11.30 p.m. curfew. The evening was filled with laughter, music, and the carefree enjoyment of a typical teenage party. But as the night went on, the girls realized they were going to be late so they hurriedly left to make it on time. In an attempt to save time, Jennifer and Elizabeth chose to take a 10-minute shortcut back to Elizabeth's home in Oak Forest. Their path led them along the railroad tracks, through T.C. Jester Park, a location only a mile from Elizabeth's home. It was an ordinary shortcut, one they believed would bring them home quicker. Meanwhile, in the shadowy depths of the park, a gathering of a different sort was taking place. Six members of the Black and White Gang were drinking beer and unwinding. They were celebrating the initiation of their newest member, 17-year-old Raul Omar Villariel. Villariel wasn't previously associated with any gang, but tonight, he'd been put through the brutal ritual of fighting multiple gang members one after another. By about 10.30 p.m., having been temporarily knocked unconscious during his third fight, the gang members huddled to decide his fate. Peter Cantu, the gang's leader, approached the recovering Villariel, praising him for being so tough and welcoming him into their gang. About 40 minutes later, the girls walked into the men, who were now even more rowdy because of the beer they were drinking. As Jennifer and Elizabeth tried to get past them, Jose Medellin tried to touch Elizabeth inappropriately. She brushed him off, which made him angry. He grabbed her and pulled her toward the other gang members, and instead of running away, Jennifer bravely tried to help her friend, but the gang overpowered her. Then, the men did something horrible. They forced the girls to take off their clothes and hurt them in very cruel ways, each taking part in this. The girls tried their best to fight back, with Jennifer biting them a few times and Elizabeth kicking hard. During this terrible time, they would sometimes look at each other, their eyes full of worry and sadness. After they had attacked the girls, the leader of the gang, Peter Cantu, worried that the girls would identify them. So, he gave a cold-blooded command to the others to end the girls' lives. Following his order, Raul Valariel began to strangle Jennifer while making Elizabeth watch as they took her best friend's life. Elizabeth, desperate to live, tried to convince the men to let her go. She offered them her phone number, 
saying they could hang out if they let her live, but they didn't listen. When she tried to run, Peter Cantu caught her. Then, along with Jose Medellin and Efrain Perez, strangled her using several shoelaces as well. And to make sure they weren't by some magic still alive, they stomped on their necks. As the gang left the terrible scene, Peter carelessly gave Venacio Medellin a goofy wristwatch taken from Jennifer's body, saying, take this, I don't want it. Oh, but the awful story didn't end there. They went back to Peter's house, where his brother and sister-in-law noticed that Velariel was bleeding and Perez's shirt was stained with blood. When asked, Jose just said they'd had fun and that the news would soon tell the details. He confessed that he had hurt the girls. Later, Peter Cantu shared the things they had stolen from the girls. Jose got a ring with an E on it, which he planned to give to his girlfriend, Esther. He mentioned that it would have been easier to kill the girls if they had a gun. And Sean O'Brien's lack of guilt was caught on video later, showing him smiling at the place where they had killed the girls. However, it was only after they left that Peter's sister-in-law, Christina Cantu, managed to convince her husband Joe to report the crime to the police. As Jennifer and Elizabeth didn't come home by the agreed-upon time, both their families grew concerned. Elizabeth's mother, Melissa, began calling around, hoping to hear that they were safe and sound at a friend's house, but there was no sign of the girls. At first, their parents assumed they had lost track of time and would soon come rushing through the door. However, as hours turned into a whole day, their worry turned into panic. Soon, they contacted the police and reported Jennifer and Elizabeth as missing. At first, there wasn't much the authorities could do. They had no leads and had to consider the possibility that the girls had simply run away. It wasn't an uncommon occurrence with teenagers. But as the girls' families insisted, the authorities started to take the matter more seriously. Three days after Jennifer and Elizabeth were last seen, Two railway workers stumbled upon a horrifying sight near T.C. Jester Park. The scene was so gruesome and decomposed due to the intense summer heat that the girls were only identifiable by their dental records. The discovery confirmed the worst fears of their families and set in motion a series of events that would eventually lead to the arrest and prosecution of the gang. Meanwhile, Peter Cantu and his gang were not doing a great job at staying quiet about their dreadful deeds. Word had gotten out about the crimes they had committed, as they boasted about it to their friends and family. Peter's sister-in-law, Christina Cantu, who was disturbed by the brutal details, decided to do the right thing. She contacted the Houston Police Department and provided them with the information that could lead to the arrest of the perpetrators. Armed with this new information, the police quickly moved into action. Raids were conducted, and one by one the members of the gang were rounded up. Peter Cantu, Efrain Perez, Raul Velariel, Jose Medellin, Sean O'Brien, and Venacio Medellin were taken into custody. The evidence against them was overwhelming. The items stolen from Jennifer and Elizabeth were found in their possession, including Jennifer's goofy wristwatch and Elizabeth's ring with the E. Furthermore, they had been seen and recorded on camera near the crime scene, displaying no remorse for what they had done. Confronted with the evidence, some of the gang members began to admit to their parts in the crime. Their accounts, although varied in some details, all told the same horrifying story of the brutal attack on Jennifer and Elizabeth. The trials for the Ertman Pena case began in 1994, with each of the six accused standing separate trials. The trial attracted national attention because of how brutal the crime was. Key evidence in the trials included the items stolen from the girls and the confession of the gang members. Even more damning was the video of Sean O'Brien laughing at the murder scene, which left a chilling impression on the jury. Peter Cantu, who was seen as the ringleader of the group, was the first to be tried. He was found guilty and sentenced to death. Jose Medellin, Raul Velario, Efrain Perez, and Sean O'Brien were also found guilty for their roles in the crime. Like Cantu, they were all sentenced to death. The youngest of the group, Venacio Medellin, was only 14 at the time of the crime, too young to be given the death penalty according to Texas law. Instead, he was given a 40-year sentence. Despite being involved in the horrific crime, Venacio Medellin was only sentenced to probation, which caused an uproar among many who followed the case. Throughout the trials, both Ertman and Pena families maintained a strong presence in the courtroom. 
They wanted justice for their daughters, and for the world to see the faces of those who had senselessly ended their lives. After the trials, the Ertman and Pena families worked hard to ensure their daughters were not forgotten. They became active advocates for victims' rights and played a crucial role in changing several laws in Texas. Their efforts led to the creation of the Jennifer Ertman and Elizabeth Pena Crime Victims' Rights Act, which allows victims' families to attend the entire trial, including the sentencing and execution of the criminals. This brutal crime and its lasting impact continues to serve as a stark reminder of the importance of swift and effective action in missing person cases, and of the vital need for justice for victims and their families.